you. We are getting into Exodus chapters 30 and 31. It's part two of what we looked at yesterday. Uh, when you go over uh, there in Exodus 31, we see God is enabling them. He's giving them skilled workers. We see this in verse 6 of Exodus chapter 31. He says, moreover, I have appointed Ohaliliab, son of Ashimach, from the tribe of Dan, to what? To help. To help what? In accomplishing what God has set out for them to do in building this tabernacle, this mobile tabernacle that is going to be gorgeous in every way. And it's gorgeous because God has given specific skill sets by the anointing of God's Holy Spirit for individuals that are skilled. Notice what it says. Also, I have given what? Ability to all the skilled workers, not some of the skilled workers, all of the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. So what is God doing so powerfully? God enables individuals to accomplish everything that God has commanded. So when you look at this, this remember, where, where are we getting this premise that everything that is here is about the foreshadowing of what this, what is to come? We get this from where? From Jesus. When Jesus was on earth, he says, look, I'm here to fulfill all that is written in the law and the prophets. When he says that, some people think he means that, oh, he's here to do everything that is in the law and the prophets. No, but when you look at Luke chapter 24, verses 44 and following, he gives us the definition of what it means to fulfill. And what he says there very clearly is that I have fulfilled all that is written about me in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. And what does he say? My death burial, resurrection, and repentance, and forgiveness of sins. So when Jesus says, I'm here to fulfill, what is he talking about? I am, what, or should I say, what is written in the Old Testament was only a foreshadowing of what was to come in me. In what? Death, burial, resurrection, and repentance, and the forgiveness of sins. So when we go back and look at all that is written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, we see a foreshadowing what is to come in Jesus. And in Exodus chapter 31, and we look in here in verse 6, the second half of 6, he says, what does God say? Also, I have given the ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. What are we getting at? About what? The tent of meeting, the Ark of the Covenant with the atonement cover on it. All these things are symbolic of what is to come in God's church. What is church? The ecclesia, the called out of God. And God is saying, hey, look, in this imagery, you see the foreshadowing of what is to come in my church. And what does he say? I have given ability to all the skilled workers. So for God's first century church, to function, God has given all of us workers to make everything that God has called to come to fruition. So what God has called the church to be, God has enabled all of us with certain skill sets to accomplish what God intended in his church. So when you feel like, man, um, how do I get a community that is... Um, uh, fulfilling God's intended purposes because you look around and maybe you feel like that's a daunting task. It's challenging. Don't be discouraged because God has equipped all his workers. What's up, Mike? How you doing, man? Uh, uh, go geek garage. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, what, what do we, what do we see here? We see that God has enabled workers. Now notice what he calls them. He calls them two words here, skilled workers, skilled workers. What does that mean? Well, number one, there's a gift set. There's a skill. There's an ability that others may not have that, 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 you, that sets individuals apart. The second part is a worker. What does that mean? 
God wants us to be what? Participants. <laughs> God wants us to be participants, workers in the fellowship. You know, it's so easy for us to kind of just show up and be what? Entertained, encouraged, lift up, fulfilled, and, and, and not be a worker. God wants all of us to take whatever skill set God has blessed us with to be a worker in participating towards God's overall goal for his church. So that means if your gift is service, then when you show up in the fellowship, you need to be the one that is serving. <laughs> you, you may say, well, there's so many pe other people they don't serve like me. Well, that may be true um, and accurate, but it's true and accurate for a reason. You have the gift of service. We see that laid out in Corinthians. There's certain gifts. You have a certain skill set that you naturally know how to do in an excellent way that others do not. And so you have to come and go to work in that skill set. You will say, well, man, I'm tired. Well, that's why it's called a worker. It's not called a sleeper. It's not called someone who lays and rests all the time. It's not called a relaxer. No, you are a skilled worker. Oh, man. And God has given you a gift set that many don't have. Now, why is that? Well, because you can serve as an edifier to many others not only as an edifier, lifting and encouraging and helping, but you also set an example that others can follow. They may not be able to do it uh, as, best you, as best as you can, but they can at least follow your example in what they do have to offer. Very powerful. Maybe your gift is the gift of comfort. You have the ability or healing, as I like to put it, it seems like everyone that has some, <laughs> some really challenging things going on in their life, they seem to gravitate towards you because you have a gift of healing. What is that? You have a gift of listening. You have a gift that is really able to get in touch with what people are going through. And people feel this certain natural comfort in being able to sit and talk with you about challenging things that are going on because you have an ability to listen to understand, and to encourage them along their way. You have a special gift set. that You are a gift of healing. And so what does God want you to do with that? He wants you to be a worker, right? A worker in that. And you may go, man, I, you know, sometimes I get tired. No, no. Or sometimes you can get frustrated that other people aren't like you. Well, listen, you have a gift set. You know, you have a gift like Mozart or or uh, 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 some of these great artists of old times. They have a gift. It would be really weird if they got mad that others could not bring together music or artistry like they could. No, they wouldn't be mad. That's unnatural. Why? Because they understood that they had a gift set. You have a gift set. Don't get upset or frustrated that everyone is not like you. Why? Because God has given you a certain gift set to be a worker. Notice, God gave the abilities. He gave all the skilled workers abilities to do it. The skilled workers didn't turn around and demand that the unskilled workers participate in doing the artistry in the temple. They just couldn't. It was impossible for them to do it. And no different for us in the New Testament if you have a gift set. So when we look at these gifts, let's look, we're, we're taking this, this section from Exodus 31 to look at its fulfillment in some. And yesterday, we looked at a number of places where God uses his spirit for the edification or the purposes of his will. We talked about God appointing prophets. We looked at Jeremiah. We talked about God appointing Israel's kings. We looked at Samuel. We looked at Saul and saw how God did it. We saw that God, through his spirit, even <clears throat> appointed foreign kings. Uh, we looked at the, the king of Persia. 
Cyrus. Here's a, an individual that was a polytheist, but yet God in Isaiah 45 appoints him for certain tasks. We see that the spirit of God, it does move towards God's accomplishing, accomplishing God's will with those that are lost and those that are saved. So, so often we think, well, if God's spirit moves, that sometimes it can't move in the heart or in the life of those who don't know God. God can do anything. We see God hardened Pharaoh's heart, or should I say made it heavy so that God could display his greatness. So don't get caught up in uh, thinking that uh, God's spirit is doesn't move in other ways. It moves. It has no boundaries in what it wants to accomplish. The indwelling of God's spirit is something very different. God empowers leaders uh, and kings with his spirit. We see that in Judges. We see that in Samuel. Throughout the Old Testament, we see different individuals being empowered by God's spirit. Very, very powerful. We see the spirit was given to uh, Jesus. It talks about Jesus coming uh, and the power of the spirit was present for him to do miraculous signs and wonders. Understand, you know, this is not separate from God. It's a part of God. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, you look at us, we have arms and legs and heads and torsos and all this other kind of stuff, hands, eyes. These are all a part of of our body, no different than God. The, the spirit is a part of God. It is the essence of God, uh, very powerful, and it has a function, no different than the different parts of our body have different functions. Our eyes do not have the same function as our hands, right? Very, very uh, uh, powerful in every way. We see the apostles. Yesterday, we closed out with the apostles being endowed with power from the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells him in Luke chapter 24, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Something very distinctive about the apostles. These individuals were to receive power from on high to accomplish God's will in spreading the gospel all over the earth. They had a special calling to get the gospel message to the ends of the earth. And so what does God do? He empowers them with the Holy Spirit to get the message out. We see that, turn over to Acts chapter one, verse eight. Notice what Jesus says to them. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Very powerful. The illustration that we see of God giving certain gift sets in Exodus chapter 31 to accomplish his will, we see that also fulfilled in the New Testament where God empowered the apostles, these 12 individuals, to be messengers to get the message to the entire world. What does that tell us? That the Holy Spirit is active in getting the message out. How does God do that? Well, his Holy Spirit is everywhere. What does Peter say? He quotes Joel chapter two. He says, in the last days, God says he will pour out his spirit, literally pouring out his spirit uh, all over the earth. And so God's spirit is all over the earth. It is totally connected to everything that is going on in our universe. It is connected to it all. And therefore it is working in accomplishing God's will through the people here on earth, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. The Holy Spirit is assessing what is going on. Jesus says, when I leave, you need not worry because I'm sending what? A helper. He called it a helper. In other words, it's going to enable us to accomplish God's will. He says it will convict the world, not just one individual, but the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. These are three pivotal points that it will do. Well, why? Because it encompasses all that we know, and it moves but within us. 
to accomplish these things, sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And God, what and Jesus says to the apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. There is power. It enables you to accomplish God's will. You need not worry about <clears throat> what God is going to do through you because the Holy Spirit is going to help you. Understand that you are the vessel through which God's going to move through his powerful Holy Spirit. So act like it, live like it, live in reverence of God, live connected to yourself and what God's intended purposes are. In every scenario, you need to ask yourself, what is God's will here? How is God trying to move in such a way to accomplish his will? God, reveal your will to me, that I may be a servant in this situation, that the Holy Spirit may move, right, towards what? Convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And guess what? God's Spirit gives power. Now, we also know that the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit, God gives gifts to the church. <clears throat> Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, again, what are we doing? We're looking at Exodus chapter 31, and we're, we're taking what God has done through his spirit and giving gifts to others to accomplish his will there as a foreshadowing of what he was to do here in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, look at the fulfillment. For Christ himself gave the apostles. Now, here it is. What is he saying here? Um, Christ, before he left, what did he do? Well, he set us up in accomplishing God's will for the first century church and all of us. Well, what did he do? For Verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4. So Christ gave, Christ himself gave what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. <clears throat> so what do we see? We see that these are gifts, <clears throat> that this is a certain skill set that was left behind by Christ, and he, and he categorizes it in four different uh, areas, or five, I think, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So what do we see here? Apostles. Well, what were they? They were empowered by the Holy Spirit to, uh, to accomplish a radical dream of getting the message preached throughout the entire earth. They were given special signs and wonders, 2 Corinthians 12, that we looked at yesterday. <clears throat> they were given certain signs, wonders, and miracles as testimony to who they were. Well, how did they get those? They got those through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And what was it its intended? What was its intended purposes? To get the message throughout the entire world. So Jesus left apostles. Remember in Exodus 31, he gave certain skills to accomplish his will. God gave a certain skill set to a very few apostles to get the message out. The second one is prophets. Well, why was were prophets necessary? Individuals that spoke the word of God. It is through prophets that we have the word of God, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We had prophets. What, what was the intended purpose there? That they could give us God's word. You know, you can't accomplish God's will if you don't have God's word. And so Jesus himself gave us what? Prophets. Not everyone is a prophet. And we see this in the New Testament. Not everyone was. But there were few that were selected to be that vehicle through which God would give a certain skill set, a certain gift through his spirit that enables us to accomplish God's will. You can't accomplish God's will if you don't hear God's will. And the prophets were given that so that we could hear God's will. Very, very. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the gifts. Hey, listen. We're here every morning, 
7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. What do we do? We get into the Word of God every morning. We jump in. We go verse by verse. Yes, it takes us a long time to work through different texts because we're methodically working through them. We're trying to find every nugget, and it leads us down a great path of great investigation of God's Word. But we're here every morning, 7 a.m. And if you're joining with us for the first time and you like what you're hearing, Come on in and follow, just like Kathy. I appreciate it. Why? Because that's telling me that there are people out there that actually like this content. Every time I look at the stats after this, 80-some-odd percent of the people that listen for this hour almost don't even follow. And I go, no, don't do that. That discourages me. Encourage me by clicking the follow. Why? Because that lets me know. It says, hey, Chip, guess what? There are people out there that actually like this content. And when I find out there are people that like this content, you know what I do? I keep bringing this content. I bring it, even for those who don't agree with it, like S.D. Benson, who constantly joins us. What's happening, man? How you doing? So I appreciate folks that come and say, hey, well, you know, I like hearing you. I may not agree with you, but I like hearing you. And I appreciate that. And so what does that do? It inspires me to keep on bringing this content. So that's what I do. And we do it every morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If for some reason you miss some of this, no problem, because I got a link where? In the bio. You click that link in the bio on the profile page, takes you right to my YouTube page, at Chip Mitchell 23 And everything we've done for the last year is up there on YouTube. And you can use it as you see fit for yourself, for friends and family or strangers that you meet that are looking for this kind of content, we have it. And that's what we do. So welcome to Grounded in His Promises. So what are we looking at today? So here it is, Exodus 31. What do we see? We see God giving skills to accomplish his will. We see the fulfillment of that in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Christ also gave himself apostles. We see prophets, but then we see evangelists. These are ministers. These are preachers of God's word. Well, what does he what does he do for that? He gives them a certain gift set in, in being able to proclaim the gospel message. They have a talent of inspiration. They have a talent of proclaiming the truth. They have a talent of, of, of speaking uh, the word of God and, and being able to, to take com the complexities of the scriptures and make them plain and simple. They have a, an ability to inspire listeners to be moved from point A to point B. You know, you look at uh, 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 the Apostle Paul. He, he had daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannius, went on for two years. That takes a certain gift that he had. He was an evangelist, a proclaimer of the truth, uh, which is very powerful. Then he says, pastors. Well, what's a pastor? A pastor is an elder. This is um, a shepherd of God's flock. Far too often people think that evangelists or ministers are all pastors. That's not accurate. A pastor is an elder. You look at the elder qualifications in 2 Timothy, and you get a chance to see they're shepherds of the flock. What are they? They're father figures in God's church. They're, they serve as a father figure to ensure that the household of God is going well. That's their role. God gave certain people gifts, pastoral gifts as elders. You know, and a lot of times you can look at them and think, oh man, they're so amazing. They're this, they're that. They have a gift. This is a gift. And, and they're using it for what? Remember what we read in uh, Exodus? The skilled individuals are workers. You have this gift. You need to work that gift for the edification of God's church. The last one he puts on here are teachers. These are individuals that are able to teach the word of God. They're able to take the complexities of problems in the world, challenges that we face in the world, and they are to, they're able to simplify them, identify the challenge, and then clearly methodically work through a methodology in teaching God's word. This is a gift set, and God has given these gift sets for the edification of his church. These are gifts from God. What's, what's that mean? That any individual that has any of these gifts, it's not because they're just awesome. 
it's not because they are super righteous or super special in that way. No, God has just given them a gift with an intended purpose. That, that's all they are. They're no better than anyone else. And it's so easy to get caught up in someone's gift and not caught up in the gift giver. God has given a gift. And, and, and those that have the gift need to humbly serve as a worker for God it, with God's intended purpose. We can't take gifts that we have and think we're better, more righteous, more special, than anyone else. We're not. We're just an individual that God has tasked to be a worker to accomplish his will. That's the way we need to look at it. That's the way if we are uh, the individual that is blessed with a gift, and that's the way we ought to look at it if we are one who's being served by the gift. But at the end of the day, these gifts are made for God's intended purposes. Now, notice what he says, because listen to what he says. So he gave them this is Ephesians 4, verse 11. So what does he say? He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Now watch what he says in verse 12. To equip his people for what? Works of service. So now watch, see what God's intended purpose was. His intended purpose with these five gifts is for what? the equipping of God's people for works of service. So those who have been gifted are to be at work with what the gift provides. And those that are the receivers of that work from the gift giver or from the those who are gifted are to do what? Works of service. So in other words, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers are at work in their skill set so that the people that are edified by their skill set do what? Works of service. So in other words, the recipients of teachers, the recipients of prophets, evangelists, and pastors of their skill set, <clears throat> the recipients are to turn around and do works of service. Well, what are the works of service? The works of service are the things that Christ did. And what did Christ do? He proclaimed the message, right? He served his brothers and sisters, right? And then he served the poor and the needy. So there's three areas that we find ourselves in works of service. We're imitating Christ. Now, in order to imitate Christ, we need pastors, teachers, evangelists, uh, elders, <clears throat> and prophets to teach us, to direct us, to guide us in what? Works of service. Well, what are the works of service? Well, the works of service are the exact things that Jesus did. And how did Jesus do it? He served his brothers and sisters. <clears throat> he served the loss in proclaiming <clears throat> repentance for the kingdom of God is near. And he served the poor and needy. So when we look at each other, <clears throat> Who are we to be? We are to imitate Christ in works of service. So we have to give ourselves in these three areas to one another. Well, what does Jesus say? No greater love is this than one lay down his life for his brothers and sisters. So we are to give of ourselves to one another. We are to give of ourselves to the lost as Jesus reached out to those and repent for the kingdom of God is near. Uh, uh, the kingdom of God is near, right? That that that's that's what we ought to proclaim the message. This is a work of service. Uh, and thirdly, we ought to be uh, those who serve the poor and needy. This is what we saw in Jesus. We saw him doing this. And what Jesus leaves behind in these five gift sets are individuals that will equip us to be in work. You, you follow me? That that's that's what we see. Those are the areas that Jesus gave of Himself, and these are the areas that we likewise will give of ourselves. It's just uh, it's just powerful in every way, and that's 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 the um, the what God's intended purpose is with the gifts. Now, God gives us these gifts in so many different ways, 
um, which which is powerful. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, it says, and God has placed in the church, what? First of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. So what do we see here in 1 Corinthians 12? Well, the Corinthian church, there was there was a, a list, a gift set of different things that were there for God's intended purpose. And I love that it says that gifts of healing, helping, and guidance. You know, we, we, we tend to jump to tongues, miraculous signs, and wonders. But look at what verse 12, uh, or verse 28 says, healing, helping, and guidance. Healing, helping, and guidance. Boy, think about that in the lives of all of us. Um, we need healing at different times, right? And God has provided certain gift sets through his Holy Spirit that enable healing. Sometimes we think of only the physical healing of an ailment or a sickness or a disease, but there's emotional trauma that has come about in our lives. You know, one of the things that we do um, with the nonprofit organization I work with is uh, we go into prisons and offer counseling on trauma, you know, um, and in one of the women's prisons here in Philadelphia, you know, we have uh, a number of women that go in and, and work with um, these women. Um, and it's about 16 women that they work with, uh, helping them to overcome the trauma that has been in their lives. You've got people that have been there. One woman who helps to serve, she has, um, uh, she had been on her own since she was, you know, 10 years old. And at 12 years old, her mom, her dad was dead. He was murdered. Uh, mom was uh, strung out on drugs and alcohol. And this 12-year-old was at home all alone. And and mom would be gone for a month at a time, not knowing where she's at. And the 12-year-old had to figure out what to do. And the 12-year-old was terrified that the city would come in and put her in foster care so she would wake herself up and go to school because she said if someone figured out that no one was there, she'd be in trouble. And and so she would get up and go to school. Sometimes she was motivated to go to school because she was like, this is probably the only meal I'm going to get. I mean, by going to school, her mom was out prostituting herself or high on drugs um, you know, and she's 12 years old. And then at 15, she winds up being pregnant and her mom is still running the streets and not around. She was never taught even how to be a woman, let alone be a mom, never. And so now she's married. She's got incredible children and incredible marriage and husband. And now she's going back into these prison situations, helping the women there deal with the trauma that has been in their life helping them to understand that you there is a there is a new chapter there is an uh an opportunity for them to be deaf but what does she have she has a gift of healing helping and guiding i mean she she totally has she's been through hell she's been through hell but now she has the gift of healing helping and guiding but why because god's spirit has gifted her in the midst of great tragedy to be a great servant in the hopes of folks that are in desperate situations having an opportunity to be different. And now she's working with this one. One woman has been 16 years and now has gotten out and she's working with her, giving her guidance to get her reunited with her family, to get her back up on her feet so she could be a, a giving participant to the community rather than a taker. Well, why, why is she able to do this? Because she has the gift of healing, helping and God. And remember, God wants us to work on three different levels with one another, our brothers and sisters, with the lost who do not know God, and the poor and needy. We have another program doing the same thing with some men that are in prison. And the other day, um, uh, two, two, three of the folks went out and they were working with a gentleman that's in prison. He's been in prison for a while and his little daughter had her fourth birthday. And because he's been going on the workforce program, um, <clears throat> What what is he doing? Chip, do you understand people get hurt 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. People get hurt by false prophets and false teachers all the time, but I'm not going to let that stop me from doing right. And this is why we have this prison program. Some of the people in there probably been hurt by false prophets and teachers of spirituality, but I'm not going to allow that to stop me, C.D. Benson, from doing right. And I'm going to preach out against those that do wrong. And I'm going to serve those who've been wrong. And I'm going to offer them what the Spirit has enabled, healing, helping, and guidance. This man's been in prison for a number of years, not being able to see his, his daughter grow up. She just turned four. But because he was a part of this workforce program, he was able to earn a little bit of money while he's in prison, earning money in the workforce program to rehabilitate himself. And so with that money, he was able to ask us to go and buy a few gifts for his daughter because she turned four. And the daughter doesn't really know her dad, but she knows her dad is incarcerated. And so what were they able to do? They were able to show up at the house and the little girl came out and, and they were able to give her gifts. And, and I remember Mel just saying to the daughter, this is from your dad. Your dad loves you and he will be back at some point, but he loves you and wants you to have an awesome uh, birthday. I mean, what, a, what an incredible, uh, incredible gift. What an incredible opportunity um, that we see here. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Why? Turning lives around, helping people to have a sense of dignity, a sense of self-worth, a sense of hope. This little girl doesn't understand what happened to her dad. This little girl, all she knows is my dad's not here. My dad, I speak to him behind some window or something like that, or my dad's never home or tuck me in, but she can have a sense of respect and dignity for her dad because her dad is making progress. Well, why? Because God has gifted individuals with healing, helping, and guidance, and they are working in that so that they can serve God's intended purposes. God wants lives turned around, and we get to be willing participants in that. And you can say whatever you want to say about the falsehood and the institution of Christianity out there. You can say whatever you want about false teachers and all that. They are what they're going to be. We had them in the Old Testament. We had them in the New Testament. And they're going to be around. But never let that stop us from doing right by God. Never let us be thwarted by any falsehoods that are out there or any hip hypocrisy that is out there. We go and do what God has called us to do. And let me tell you, love never fails. But we see this <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a very powerful, powerful illustration of seeing what God does in the functioning of God's purposes with his gifts. And, and so we, uh, that's what we do. And so when you continue reading in Ephesians 4, what does he say here? He says, equip this people for works of service. For what reason? So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. But what is he saying? That there isn't unity in the faith. That we haven't reached the full knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We have to powerfully continue to advance what God has started by the gifts that God has given us. Wow. Very, very powerful uh, when you look at this. And I tell you, man, it, it, it's just an amazing uh, portrayal of Exodus chapter 31 with God giving certain gift sets and skills to those who need them. Wow. We're going to end right there. I hope that this has been powerful and edifying to you. <clears throat> Very, very powerful in what we see, what God has done. And if you like what you hear, like and subscribe. We're here every morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Back at you with Grounded in a